Good morning, Mark Barnes, and I am the Second Amendment Foundation and the Citizens Committee's attorney in Washington, D.C., and this morning I'm going to try to share my thoughts with you on how I view the next uh, 13 or 14 months in Washington. Uh, I could take the title of a film, It's Complicated, and it really is complicated. I practice every day before ATF and the Department of State. I represent hundreds of folks in the gun trade and uh, also before the State Department on import and export control issues. Um, I, I want to comment on one thing that uh, Joe mentioned, which was the 86 Amendment, the machine gun ban at 18 U.S.C. 922-0. Um, it just demonstrates the importance of how when an error was made in the past, we need to come back to it and try to correct it because now I can tell you in 2014 ATF promulgated a ruling that now makes it impossible for the defense trade, the gun trade, to collaborate to serve our allied and NATO forces overseas. So for example, if you make a machine gun and Boeing or another manufacturer needs to mount it on a gunship to give to the United Kingdom, we can't do a transfer of the machine guns to Boeing for them to integrate onto the aircraft. So the amendment not only has impacted private gun ownership, but now it's presenting a threat in my judgment to our national security objectives. So I think we have a basis to go back to the Congress and as was pointed out, perhaps with a change of leadership, we can show just how bad this thing is all the way around. Um, the Democrats, of course, remain committed to their agenda to limit access to firearms and to shrink the amount of guns that can be accessed. Um, however, from my viewpoint, they're equally as trepid about being too overt about it because they are deathly afraid of the political consequences that can follow from their actions during the electoral period. So they have found two safe haven strategies. The first one is talk a big talk, but don't do the walk. And I'm gonna give you some examples in just a second. And the second hot issue is mental health in light of some of the very tragic shootings that we've had in the last couple of years. Now, the talk a big talk. Well, there's no question, as has been pointed out, that uh, President Obama promised he would be extremely aggressive, and he has been aggressive. He's been aggressive on environmental issues, on foreign affairs, wage and hour rules, doing all of these things without congressional involvement and, in my judgment, exceeding his statutory authority. But, you know, his view is, so what? It doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to be in office, and I'm going to keep pushing the envelope until somebody sues me or stops me with the legislation, neither of which has really occurred, except mostly in our area. There have been some pushback in some other areas, but you've seen what he's done. Now, you would expect that he would be equally aggressive in our area. I'm not here to say that he won't be, but I am here to point out an interesting fact. In May, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms published their, what they call their unified regulatory agenda. And it's a heads up to you, the American people, of what they plan on doing to you. And in that agenda, they had a series of regulatory, we're thinking about it, proposals on mental health, uh, expanding definitions for prohibited possessors under the Gun Control Act, restraints or restrictions on certain types of handguns, uh, safe storage requirements, and the list is fairly long. Now that was in May. Not one single notice of proposed rulemaking has moved forward off of that agenda yet. Now for some of you in this room that are vitally concerned about things that have been published in the Federal Register, for instance, on NFA trusts. Um, they were supposed to have that out by the end of the summer. That didn't happen. Then they mentioned that they should have it done by November. I have pretty good information that it's not even going to happen in November. Well, okay. So the president's talking a big talk. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be vigilant. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep hard at work and in fact, bring litigation like the Second Amendment Foundation and Citizens Committee have done, or take advantage of the new leadership in Congress to push back on the administration. 
I am simply saying, though, they are being clever because not only are they taking advantage of that safe haven by playing to their base, but yet not really ponying up to the table. Yet, anyway, he might, he might just do that, and we're going to have to be ready for it. The second safe haven uh, that they've been using is uh, mental health. And on the mental health issue, um, <clears throat> they, in my opinion, are moving closer and closer to trying to redefine on a mental health basis who can have access to firearms. Um, now, this is all under the penumbra, and I know other speakers will speak to this today, of the doctrine called keeping America safe. Their definition of keeping America safe, however, is to redefine who under the Gun Control Act can have access to firearms, particularly on a mental health basis. This cross supports the efforts that Bloomberg is undertaking as well in terms of trying to regulate all private transfers in the United States, closing the so-called gun show loophole, and some of these other efforts. But on regulating who has access to firearms and sort of fooling with that definition, it's already been accomplished a little bit in some subtle ways. For example, uh, without too much fanfare, the president promulgated a regulation that said, well, look, you know what, if you have been commanded to go to outpatient drug treatment as a part of a program of diversion, in other words, you haven't been convicted of a felony, and as an alternative to having a criminal record, we're going to put you into mandatory outpatient drug treatment. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I think that's an involuntary commitment. So boom, you're disabled under the Gun Control Act. Now, how about this? On September 16th, uh, Congressman uh, Sam Johnson, thank God, introduced a bill that is pushing back on yet another very subtle but very important administrative, uh, administration initiative in this area. How many people in this room know what a, um, a, pay, a representative payee is under the Social Security Act? Okay. In many cases, a representative payee, you know, grandma's at home, she's a gun owner, but she would prefer to have her son manage her financial affairs for her. There's nothing wrong with grandma. However, the Social Security Administration has been reporting to the NIC system in Martinsburg, West Virginia with the FBI, who has representative payees. It must be a presumption that somehow they can't manage their own affairs and they're incompetent. Of course, if they go to try to buy a firearm and that's in the NICS system, a hold is put on the gun transaction and now they're going to have to prove that they're not disabled under the Gun Control Act. So hopefully this legislation will pass um, because we need to push back on exactly what they're trying to do in terms of redefining who can have access to guns in America. Um, <clears throat> what's really sad about all of this, particularly amount around the mental health issues, I used to serve at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. You know, if the president were really serious about mental health, he would have a national level effort to rebuild our mental health efforts in community-based treatment, to give parents real interventions for troubled children and other individuals in our communities, but that's not happening. Instead, his answer on mental health seems to be, let's just try to restrict more people from having access to firearms. And I, I just find that incredibly disappointing because it doesn't really get at the real issues that we're facing in our country. So um, in my view, it is complicated. We're facing a lot of deep challenges. Uh, and again, while, it's, while from my standpoint, there seems to be a lot of talk coming out of the White House, not a lot of action. There are some exceptions, and one that you're going to hear about this morning is from Doug Ritter at Knife Rights. The administration, of course, has proposed an ivory ban, which will impact both knife owners and gun owners. It's absolutely absurd. It's going to make it impossible for anyone to alienate their personal property and sell traditional ivory that's been grandfathered in for possession and ownership in our country for years. 
Uh, many in the gun community are fighting back, and Knife Rights is one of those organizations, and you'll hear more about that from Doug uh, later, uh, well, actually this weekend, I think on Sunday. In summary then, we have to remain vigilant, but the administration is being clever. They're trying to make some administrative inroads, but not to be too obvious about it, except to be vocal. Yet, uh, if they see an opening, and we are not there to defend our Second Amendment rights, we're going to get hurt, and we're going to get hurt badly. So watch out. Keep a careful eye on what's happening administratively and through the agencies. We do every day. Thank you very much.